At the 20th century's close, marriage could no longer be considered a predictable venture. Is that correct? That's correct. Marriage in part, marriage laws in part, reflect concerns about population size, correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Marriage laws in part reflect concerns about population size? It's certainly a potential, yes, of marriage laws to be concerned about that. The alteration in the relationship between marriage and the state might be called disestablishment, correct? Yes or no? As a heuristic device, yes, it might. In the history of religion, the term disestablishment is sometimes used, correct? It is a descriptive term in the history of religion. In some countries, there is an established religion, and the ending of that special status is called disestablishment, correct? Yes. Disestablishment did not mean that religious institutions disappeared, correct? Correct. On the contrary, the consequence more often of disestablishment was that religious sects proliferated and no single model was no longer supported and enforced by the state, correct? Yes. By analogy, one could argue that the particular model of marriage, which was no, uh, which was for so long the officially supported one, has been disestablished, correct? Uh, one could argue. Today, plural marriages have bloomed, in your opinion, correct? Illegally, yes. And, in fact, in your opinion, marriage is now understood as a private choice today, correct? A choice whether to marry or not to marry is understood as a private choice, yes. This dance has allowed hundreds and perhaps thousands of individuals to revive polygamy, correct? I don't think it's that that has allowed it. Well, let's look at what you wrote in Public Vows, page uh, 213, tab 31. I'm sorry, tell me the page again, please. You wrote in the first full paragraph in the second sentence, couples who are not following the conventional model look for endorsement from like-minded communities and expect to be left alone by others whom they are not harming since marriage is understood as private choice. This stance has allowed hundreds and perhaps thousands of fundamentalist Mormons in Utah and Arizona to revive polygamy. Do you stand by that statement? By this observation, yes. Okay. And the emergence in politics of the new right responded in part to the apparent disestablishment of traditional marriage, correct? Yes. The new right makes a connection between the stability of conventional model of monogamy, monogamy and the health of the nation, correct? Yes. But, in your opinion, the resistance to same-sex marriage shows that the profound transformation of disestablishment has not taken place, correct? Yes. In fact, if despite sweeping ref 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 reformulations, excuse me, in intimate relations in the past quarter century, one can doubt whether most Americans' common sense about marriage has vastly changed? Yes, I think that's correct. Congressional rhetoric on behalf of the defense of marriage undercut the idea that disestablishment of the traditional institution of marriage was well underway, correct? Yes. The bill's supporters announced that traditional marriage was the fundamental building block of society, correct? They did. The bill supporters also announced that nature and the Judeo-Christian moral tradition commanded or comported with traditional heterosexual marriage, correct? They did. The bill supporters maintained that traditional heterosexual marriage was the basis of civilization, correct? They did. Congressman James Talent of Missouri declared, it is an act of hubris to believe that marriage can be infinitely malleable. That is, can be pushed and pulled around like silly putty without destroying its essential stability. He added, marriage goes, then the family goes, and if the family goes, we have none of the decency or ordered liberty which Americans have been brought up to enjoy and to appreciate. And this pretty well summed up the predominant view among the bill supporters, correct? Yes. And marriage is not an infinitely elastic contract between two people, correct? Uh, I can't answer that question. Well, let's look at the amicus brief that you signed on to, which appears behind tab 25. This is the amicus brief that was submitted to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, and you were a signatory to that brief. Is that correct? Uh, 
Let me look. Is this, uh, this is the historian's brief? Yes, the professors of history of marriage. Yes, I did sign this brief. Okay. And then let's turn to page 32, and the first sentence says, 20th century courts have made clear that marriage is not an infinitely elastic contract between two people. Do you agree with that statement? Okay. Uh, yes, I'll agree with it, not infinitely elastic. Congressman Talent, in the comments I just read, voiced attention that had been present ever since legislators began altering the terms of marriage in the 1840s, correct? Yes. And during the debate on the Defense of Marriage Act, the fear was expressed that licensing same-sex marriage would start a slippery slope to licensing polygamy, correct? It was. Now, yes. while you were at Harvard, you taught a class entitled Men, Women, and Marriage. Is that right? Uh, yes, I did. And you taught that class in 2006 or 07. Is that's that right? That sounds about right. And in that class, you assigned some selections from a collection that Andrew Sullivan had put together that were documents relating to the same-sex marriage controversy. Is that correct? Yeah, that sounds right. Your Honor, we would like to move the admission or ask the court to judicial notice of DIX 1032. We've provided copies to plaintiffs prior to trial and to the court. 1032? Yes, Your Honor. Maybe you could connect that up to the witness? Yes. Did you know of a better collection of, if, if someone wanted to look at the arguments for and against same-sex marriage as a policy matter, not as a legal matter, do you know of a better resource that captures fairly and accurately all of the different points of view that Andrew Sullivan's book? I can't answer that. I know I chose it at the time because it was convenient. I assigned a few documents within it. It was handy. I, I can't say that it's the best rendition of pro and con ideas. No, I can't affirm that. Well, can you name one that's better? Uh, this is not a type of anthology I have researched lately, so I, um, I, I just don't have the wherewithal to answer that. Okay. But when you were teaching your class at Harvard, you thought it was... I thought it was adequate. Whether it was the best, I can't say. I see. And in your class, you focused on the extent to which opposition to same-sex marriage seems to have been rooted in a fear of gender differentiation disappearing. Is that right? I, in a single lecture in the class, I, I believe I raised that as a theory of why opposition ran so deep, yes. And you've testified before that the or provided a statement to the Vermont legisl legislature that when it was considering same-sex marriage. No, not exactly. Well, in the aftermath of the ruling of the Vermont Supreme Court requiring either civil unions or same-sex marriage, you provided some input. In, not to the legislature, to their joint judiciary committee. Okay. And so it was a committee of the legislature? Yes. I see. Of both houses. I see. And when you testified or provided that statement in Vermont, the law that resulted was a compromise which gave something to the Catholics and other conservative groups and something to the LGBT community, correct? Uh, it did state in its first line, marriage is between a man and a woman, and then it went on to grant a civil union arrangement that gave all the rights and benefits to same-sex couples, yes. And all of your teaching involves political history to some degree, correct? It does. And the concept of political power is relevant to your classes, correct? Yes. And you define political power as the capability to have one's wishes effectuated, correct? Uh, in the political sphere, yes. Now, you believe that there are changed circumstances that have, that support extending marriage to same-sex couples, correct? I do. And in the 19th century, marriage was confined to a man and a woman and not extended to same-sex couples as a matter of tradition, correct? I don't believe anyone ever pressed for marriage, any couple of the same sex ever pressed for marriage, so the question was never defended. So it was. Marriage was maintained between a man and a woman in the 19th century as a matter of tradition, correct? Of custom, yes. And at the time, the homosexual as a person had not really been recognized as such, correct? Correct. 
It was homosexual uh, acts were recognized, but not the attribution of a different kind of personhood to someone because he or she had homosexual desire or practiced homosexual acts. It wasn't until the 20th century when sexuality as a mode of defining the very self of the person really came into the fore, correct? Yes. And the term homosexual today you understand that term to mean a person who is erotically desirous of members of the same sex, correct? Yes. And that's a big difference from the 19th century where gender presentation ruled interpretation of a person's behavior, not his desire, correct? We have an objection. The objection, Your Honor. I just wanted to have um, clarification as to whether counsel is talking about within the United States these customs or is he talking more broadly? Jumping around a little bit. Uh, oh, in the United States. My question today pertain to that. Very well. Can you answer? Uh, yes. I think speaking in broad scale that one can say that from centuries past, uh, when a person was judged by whether he looked masculine or she looked feminine, uh, there has been a shift from that being the principal way of identifying, uh, identifying someone's sexuality. Um, to recognizing uh, desire and uh, desire and motivation toward another individual, an individual of the same sex or an individual of the other sex. Uh, this is more definitive today in medical, psychological, social, and cultural meanings of sexuality. In your opinion, there are, excuse me, one changing circumstance is acceptance of homosexuality and the uh, recognition that discrimination against homosexuals is a form of discrimination and not simply a moral behavior, correct? What was the beginning of that long question? <laughs> well, we're talking about the changed circumstances which you believe support extending the institution of marriage to same-sex couples. And one of those changed circumstances is the recognition, in your opinion, that discrimination against homosexuals is a form of discrimination in fact and not just a moral behavior, correct? Yes. And there is a considerable social survey evidence showing that among the young, discrimination against homosexuals is much less than it was in the past century, correct? Yes. And another one of these changing circumstances is men and women's gender roles that have made them, while not completely fungible, much more duplicative of one another in many arenas of life, correct? Yes. And in your opinion, these things together make up a series of changing circumstances that make same-sex marriage a very reasonable proposition. In fact, a very reasonable thing to enact, correct? Yes. Now. Let me ask you about gender differences. You're familiar with the concept of sex ratio, by which I mean the relative proportion of men and women in a given society? Yes. And you are perfectly willing to grant that there might well be different rules when there is a scarcity of women as opposed to a scarcity of men, correct? Uh, different state rules or different customs. I'm not sure I understand. <clears throat> different customs. Different customs, yeah. And in fact, it's highly likely there would be difference in rules pertaining to sexual relations in a community where you had a relative scarcity of men as opposed to a community where you had a relative scarcity of women, correct? It's a reasonable hypothesis. Now, let's turn to no-fault divorce. The innovation of no-fault divorce indicated a major shift, correct? Yes. The provision of divorce on more and more <laughs> grounds has certainly changed marriage and changed people's expectations of marriage, correct? Yes, uh, this has been a long process beginning in the 19th century. The provision of more grounds and no fault moved that significantly in the direction of letting the spouses themselves decide on the grounds. You can't identify in any complete way the effect of no fault divorce, correct? I think that's correct. And if you're attempting to assess whether no-fault divorce changed the relative standing of men and women within marriages that persisted, it would be extremely hard to discern the answer to that question, correct? Object, Your Honor. Vague, confusing. It is a little vague. Maybe you can sharpen it up. Let me see if I'm quoting her or I'm quoting my bad question at the deposition. It was uh, page 174 of the deposition. Let me just do it this way, Professor. 
Would you agree that from a societal perspective, generally no-fault divorce, change the relative standing of men and women within marriage? I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Do you believe that behavior is really infinitely malleable by social circumstances and by culture? Uh, just about infinitely, yes. With the sole exception of self-preservation. I think you have to accept that, yes. Your Honor, may I consult with my colleagues for a brief moment? I think we're finished, but... Um... Very well. You may do so. <clears throat> Your Honor, we have no further questions. Thank you, Professor. Very well. Mr. Boutrous, any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Professor Cott, Mr. Thompson asked you uh, some questions about your personal views of the issue of whether individuals of the same gender should be able to marry. And I would like to ask you a couple of questions on that too. First, when you began your research in connection with public vows and your inquiry into the history of marriage in the United States, I guess it was back in uh, 1990, you had formed a view on whether same-sex marriage should be authorized or whether, it was a or whether it was constitutionally permissible. I hadn't formed a view. Okay. And, and what? What led you to the view that you hold today that um, concerning same-sex marriage? Uh, it really was the research and thinking I did in writing the book. Uh, and initially what the advocacy of, uh, 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 what the advocacy did rather, because it was going on beginning at the time, uh, was to point me toward the great importance of the state in creating marriages and defining marriages. Uh, and so it was a goad to my whole approach to focus on public vows. Uh, but I was really motivated to write the book because of my interest in the gender order between uh, how men and women have understood their roles in society privately and publicly. Uh, and I was most interested in how marriage has been a vehicle for shaping that. Uh, but it was through the um, through the period of the research and the writing that I learned a lot more about the history of marriage and uh, particularly about the ways that marriage laws have been used punitively. Um, I was, uh, th this was a great shock to me, uh, just how repeatedly with different groups like Native Americans, uh, blacks of course and Asians, uh, women who had made the bad choice to marry someone who was not an American at a certain period of time, the period of high immigration. Um, I, was, I was really amazed at how these laws were used punitively and restrictively, uh, yet most of those restrictions had been gradually seen to be a bar on liberty and had been dismantled. Uh, and this fed into my thinking about the question of marriage for couples of the same sex and also uh, my research on the extent to which the state, as the third party, in the bargain of the marriage had entered into the business of prescribing spousal roles. And so that history was very clear, what direction it had moved in, uh, that the state had moved more and more out of that, allowing the couple involved in choosing one another and uh, forming a marriage and household to decide themselves how they would allocate their respective duties. And so it's those, it was those things I came to see that moved me very solidly into the direction of first supporting the right of couples of the same sex to marry simply because I think it is a civil right to marry the partner of your choice. Well, if your historical research during that period had led you to conclude that history and tradition in the United States and the changes in our history did not support the elimination of barriers to individuals of the same sex marrying, would you be here today testifying in support of the plaintiffs? Mm. I don't think so, but I, uh, another thing I might mention is that in studying this history, I was really struck with the extent to which marriage has not been one thing. It has been a flexible institution. And in fact, what we, uh, the fact that um, it is so alive and vigorous today. 
and so desirable a status and that couples of the same sex want to enter it is testimony to how far it has not been one static thing over time. Uh, that it has shed its attributes of inequality and it has shed most restrictions to entering this honored institution. And I sometimes think of it as rather like our U.S. Constitution, that it has certainly essentials that remain the same, um, but it has been altered to adjust to changing circumstances so that it remains a very alive and vigorous institution today. Let me ask you about the elimination of the racial restrictions, coverture, the other discriminatory prohibitions you talked about. Did the elimination of these barriers to marriage change the social meaning of marriage? I think they changed it in a very positive direction. And uh, this was well, was particularly evident in the 60s, 70s, a uh, period of social turmoil over marriages and uh, about other things. And then the period after, in that there was a great deal of negative sentiment voiced about the institution of marriage in the 70s and many alternatives to marriage uh, then, like swinging. And these were all among heterosexuals, but open marriage. Um, many complaints about the in injustices embodied in the institution of marriage and the ways that there ought to be alternatives to it that would be socially approved. Uh, and after that, um, since then, I would say particularly in the 80s and 90s, uh, both because of groups on the right, like Focus on the Family, who have stressed all the benefits and advantages to society and the individuals of marriage and, and also importantly because of the advocacy of same-sex couples to enter the institution. I think in the past 20 to 25 years that we don't see a critical perspective on marriage as the principal thing looming in its social meaning. We see a very highly valued and honored set of expectations about the institution. And so I think this, uh, this is another suggestion that by clearing away from the marriage institution its aspects of restriction and regulation and emphasizing the liberty aspects, the creation of a zone of intimacy, that the partners choose that these emphases within marriage and in the state's prescription of what marriage is have helped to give it new reverence in recent years as compared to say 40, 50 years ago when it was really under fire. Well, what did you mean in your book, Public Vows, when you spoke about this concept of uh, disestablishment that Mr. Thompson raised with you a moment ago? Uh, well, I was using it as a heuristic device or a framework for thinking about research and suggesting, as I said, an answer to him that there might be an analogy to the disestablishment of religion, which was not bad for religion. It was actually quite good for religion in that many sects, uh, like the Methodists, the Baptists, so on, uh, were able to flourish in addition to the standard Presbyterians and Congregationalists and so on. Uh, what I really meant was that the established marriage that I have been tracking uh, over 200 years in American history was a one that prescribed spousal roles, that put strong, bright lines of morality between extramarital relationships and marital relationships, and that imposed certain restrictions on access. And disestablishment would be to give a more flexible, flexible and amplified definition of the institution. However, I, I did say that when we look, looked at, I, I was looking at the national scene. So I looked at the Defense of Marriage Act. And the strong prescription in the Defense of Marriage Act was that, that, that marriage was only between a man and a woman. Uh, this certainly made it clear that that feature of marriage was still very much established. And there was another federal law, uh, the Personal Responsibility and Work Act at the same time, which also put tremendous emphasis on marriage in a somewhat uh, backward-looking way, uh, that marriage was the way for a woman to be supported by her husband and that it was a very desirable, desirable institution in society for that reason. It seemed to go back on the law, the constitutional law, about gender asymmetry. I'm sorry, about uh, gender symmetry and equality in the marital relationship. Uh, 
But at any rate, I did conclude that the state's involvement in marriage, I think, is salutary. The question is, what is the investment going to be, and what are those definitions going to be? And I think that judging on the basis of the history, that an amplified understanding of the institution and what it can successfully accept, including the marriage of a couple of the same sex, seems to me very reasonable to assent to. Now, Mr. Thompson uh, showed you, I believe it was under tab uh, 18, the article by his own expert, Mr. Blankenhorn, in the Los Angeles Times. Do you recall that? Maybe you can turn to that? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, and you, and you recall from your work in this case, Mr. Blankenhorn has used that phrase, uh, deinstitutionalization. Do you recall that? Mm. Yes. And is disestablishment, the way you use the term, the same thing as deinstitutionalization, as you understand Mr. Blakenhorn to be using that term? Uh, I'm very puzzled by what is meant by deinstitutionalization in his usages, but I feel pretty sure that it is not what I mean by disestablishment, uh, which first of all was not. It was, as I said, a framework for thinking about what change has been. And in the, um, in the course of reviewing Mr. Blankenhorn's work and his statements, did you form any opinions about his methodology and his conclusions? I would say yes. I did have some assessments of his, um, of his overall, if not his method, which is unclear, of his conclusions and of his, uh, the concerns that he brings forward. Uh, because it seems to me that insofar as I understand deinstitutionalization as something he posits as extremely negative, uh, that is, it is to uh, render changes that have happened in the history of marriage that have proceeded and have been brought about by things other than the advocacy for same-sex marriage. That is, there has been since the 1960s a rising uh, there was a steeply rising divorce rate in the 60s in the United States. Uh, there, since the 60s, we have seen fewer couples marrying. And there has been an increase in births out of wedlock. Uh, but these seem to me the worrisome things that Mr. Blankenhorn would put under the category of deinstitutionalization. And I want to make a larger, uh, you know, a historical observation here. Uh, between 1965 and 1980, not only in the United States, but in all the industrialized world, from Europe to Japan, these indicators, the rate at which people married, the rate at which people divorced, uh, one sank, you know, one rose, and the rate of out-of-wedlock pregnancies, these underwent very sharp shifts in all these countries within the space of 15 years. Um, it was a true demographic and cultural watershed and turning point in the history of the industrialized world in which, um, and I'm citing the authority of a French demographer, Pierre Roussel, on this, but he called it the banalization of previous mores. That is, things had formerly been thought outside the pale of respectability became rese respectable, acceptable, not worthy of comment among middle class people. And it was that shift uh, that I think really is behind the concerns that Professor Blankenhorn brings forward. And these shifts, which have actually moderated since 1980, none of these indicators has continued to go up at the rate that it did suddenly zoom up. I mean, the bad indicators, uh, you know, as it did between 65 and 80. Uh, the divorce rate, in fact, in the United States, the rate of increase in the divorce rate plateaued in 1981. And while divorces continue, the numbers continue to rise. The rate of increase of divorce has plateaued for 25 years. So the question of same-sex marriage, I think, is quite separate from the kinds of concerns about what I understand Mr. Blankenhorn to be concerned about with respect to deinstitutionalization. I think it has more to do with changes that have occurred in heterosexual mores about love and sex outside of marriage. 
than it does to do with the question of same-sex couples wanting to enter the marriage institution and gain its stability and its formal imprimatur. Uh, Mr. Thompson pointed you to page 199 of your deposition, which is under tab one. I would like you to turn to that, if you would. And uh, beginning on line two, uh, where you asked, um, where he asked you the question about the Massachusetts divorce rates, you were not allowed to give the context and the full meaning of what you meant there. Could you do that now? Well, it really relates to exactly what I just said, in that I think that the, the divorce rate question is very hard to answer in a period of simply five years, which is all there has been. The only is the, the amount of time there has been same-sex marriage in Massachusetts. And that's why I would simply <clears throat> May, I, I couldn't make a claim about that relation, but the divorce rate question is a long-term trend. Now, um, since we're talking about divorce, what in your view is the relevance of the no-fault divorce movement that swept the nation, the United States, in terms of the analysis of the issues in this case, in the Perry case? I think it's very clearly that the passage of no-fault divorce here, starting in California, of course, which was the first state, and then sweeping through the states, and as well becoming the characteristic form of divorce in Europe, was an indication of the shift in weight from the state to the couple with respect to the terms of marital performance. That, as I have said, spousal roles used to be dictated by the state. Now they are dictated by the couple themselves. There's no requirement that they do X or Y if they are one spouse or the other. And similarly with divorce, that under the adversary regime that preceded the no-fault dispensation, one spouse had to accuse the other of a fault that the state had defined as the reason a marriage could be ended and led to, uh, that was behind the times, and that many couples by the 20th century both knew their marriage had broken down. Uh, one of them may not have committed the fault that the state defined, particularly in the state of New York, which only had the ground of adultery, and of course is a very large and influential state. So couples would collude to present a fault before the court, and this was the movement for no-fault divorce. Uh, it's in fact started by lawyers who thought this was very bad for the law. Uh, that people should be calling, uh, should be colluding, excuse me, and their lawyers should be colluding with them. Uh, so no fault divorce really set into actual practice what had been happening to a great extent behind the shadow of the adversary regime. And it represented that the state was no longer so interested in saying, okay, this is what breaks up a marriage, or if you are a husband, you have to do this, or if you are a, uh, you're a wife, you have to do that. And that move, it underlines the fact that gender asymmetry, that specific performance of one marital role or another, is, not, is not what is in the law of marriage these days, and seems to me to open the door of appropriateness to same-sex marriage, same-sex couples getting married. Does it reinforce that trend that you mentioned earlier? relating to mutual consent and choice in terms of the person to whom you would be married? Yes, in respect that the mutual consent and choice about the marriage ending is now part of the no-fault dispensation. When no-fault divorce swept the nation, were there alarm bells sounding concerning the effect that might have on the institution of marriage in this country? I think that at the time there were so many alarms raised about marriage between 1965 and 1980 that I'm not sure I could separate out the particular alarms by no-fault divorce uh, or about no-fault divorce, but certainly it was never uncontroversial. And any change in terms of marriage has always had its uh, points and, um, and alarms. Your Honor, I probably have about 20 minutes more of questioning. What's that? I have about 20 minutes of additional questioning. 
I can do it now, or if the court would like to break now, uh, whatever let's, court prefers. Let's just move along. Maybe you can squeeze the 20 minutes down. Okay, I can take a hint. <laughs> Professor Cott, once coverture ended in California and other places in the United States, did that put an end to the laws of marriage uh, dictating spousal roles in this country? Uh, well, not entirely, because coverture lent a very, very long shadow to the marriage relationship and the gender asymmetry of roles with respect to who was the expected provider in the family and who was the dependent. Uh, this was then reinvigorated uh, at the level of federal policy with many New Deal provisions, particularly Social Security, which gave special additional benefits to a married man when he got to the age of collecting his old age, pe old age pension. If he had a wife, his wife would receive 50 percent of his benefit that he would get as a single individual. This was a very definite material advantage to those married spouses as compared to single individuals. And it was a very major step in what has become the federal channeling of benefits through the marital relationship. It was gender specific. It did not give, uh, even if a wife had been, and she could be in the 1930s, the principal earner in her family and her husband had been her dependent. That was possible in real life. Uh, but by the time they aged, she would not be able to collect a spousal benefit for her dependent husband. So those things were challenged in the 1970s, and the Supreme Court found that spousal assignments within the marriage institution were unconstitutional. But that, uh, that was, I would say that was a reinvigoration of certain expectations of coverture that gave asymmetrical roles and particularly gave the husband the role of the provider, the main agent of the family. And did these um, asymmetrical gender roles persist into the 70s? Well, in the federal benefits, yes, most certainly. How about culturally, culturally from a historical perspective? Well, I think that the cultural, certainly the state's role in assigning benefit to marriage itself, those material advantages is one of the, uh, one of the things that holds up the particular prestige that marriage has. It's in a reciprocal relation with the other cultural evaluations. But yes, I think that uh, all of these state benefits that prescribe a certain way of living tend to have cultural impacts. And after the, uh, after the challenges in the mid-70s to the spouse specificity, uh, the gender specificity of various federal benefits, I think it's been uh, actually been a great benefit to that and has enabled wives who might want to support their husbands to be able to do that without thinking, oh, well, if we did that when we retired, we would be at a great disadvantage. In your view, as a matter of historical analysis, is the institution of family important to American society? Yes, indeed. In your view? Is the raising of children and responsible raising of children an important value in American society? It is. Objection, Your Honor. Leading. We have been given a lot of latitude, but this is bordering on testimony. Objection overruled. Uh, did you answer? It is. In your view, would providing the ability, uh, providing individuals of the same sex the ability to marry be consistent with those two American values? Yes, I think it would be. Why? I think it's clear that couples of the same sex are going to form intimate relationships and rear children of their own or adopted children. Uh, and it seems to me the public's interest for them to be able to do that in marital units that are recognized as such and honored as such. Uh, and that's even without speaking about the individual dignity uh, that being able to participate in marriage will impart to the individuals. Uh, but from a social point of view, given the extent to which marriage benefits from the point of view of the state have been always about establishing continuity 
and stability in households and social order. It seems to me that this is a direction that the state would want to go to pursue that aim. Well, Mr. Thompson asked you some questions sprinkled throughout you about polygamy. And I would like to ask you a few questions about that briefly. On page 213 of Public Vows, do you have that in front of you? I think I do because I was looking at it before. I, f I forget which number it was in the tab. At tab 31, I believe it was. Thank you. Uh, top of 213, I believe, or the first full paragraph. And uh, Mr. Thompson had read the sentence about this stance has allowed hundreds and perhaps thousands of fundamentalist Mormons in Utah and Arizona to revive polygamy. When you wrote that sentence, were you in any way endorsing polygamy? Absolutely not. And were you suggesting in any way that it had become legal? I'm just trying to find the spot. I was on 215, I think. Was it 215? Okay, uh, here we go. Yeah, first full paragraph beginning with the word commuted. Uh, no, actually, I say in the next sentence, the open practice of polygamy, uh, unprosecuted, although it is illegal, as well as officially disapproved by the Church of the Latter-day Saints. I think I was pointing to the ways in which the, um, the most states do not prosecute behavior that is seen as private, even when it is formally against the law. That, that is, I think probably many states still have adultery as a crime on their laws. I don't know for sure, but I think it has remained in many states' legal codes. Uh, but the states do not prosecute adultery, not in the state's motivation. An angry partner might but that's something else. So what I really was emphasizing here was the extent to the ex um, extent to which marital behavior has become more, um, you know, the state has given more latitude on marital behavior. I think this example, personally, I think this is an ex egregious example of state non-prosecution of something that is illegal and not at all in the tradition of American marriage. When you evaluate uh, the sweep of history in America, is there anything that suggests to you that the recognition of the ability of individuals of the same gender to marry would somehow create a slippery slope or pave the way towards lawful polygamy? I do not think so. Why not? Well, monogamy, as I said yesterday, is not only, um, it has not only come down to us through the common law and, and through uh, Christian background, it also has a political foundation in the American Republic. Uh, yesterday, when I was talking about the founders' emphasis on the consent and voluntary allegiance that they hoped for from the two B citizens of the United States being analogized to the consent and voluntary allegiance in monogamous marriage, they made an explicit contrast to polygamy, which in their political view could only be associated with despotism and non-consent because in their eyes they couldn't imagine why a woman would agree to marry a man if he already had wives that she must be being coerced. And through the long campaign against Mormon polygamy before Utah enter, entered or was allowed to enter the Union, this theme of polygamy equaling despotism, whereas monogamy equaling consent and free choice was a political theme. And so I think that monogamy is a very, very deeply ingrained in the American political tradition, as well as having certainly a religious background and a common law background, a more specific common law background. And what, in your view, as a historian, the laws of incest, Mr. Thompson referenced those, have they served? Well, as I understand it, these are some of the many hygienic or thought to be hygienic or eugenic laws that many states have put into their codes. And actually, hygienic laws have varied over time, usually in tune of what is thought to be scientific and the period from the 1880s through the 1930s with the rise of eugenics 
to the very high status. Uh, there were very many laws put into states saying that certain people considered feeble-minded couldn't marry or other characteristics and categories that we don't really use today or don't consider legitimate. Uh, for instance, uh, on the question of first of this first cousin marriage, uh, these marriages were very highly thought of and were often the most status-filled marriages. I mean, the antebellum South, for instance. It was a very common way for rich families to consolidate their holdings or over land, to have first cousins marry and not lose the family property to complete outsiders. But uh, then most of the states decided that first cousins shouldn't marry and that it was eugenically ill-advised. Uh, so these things have shifted, and the states, of course, do retain certain restrictions on marriage, uh, particularly age of consent, the age below which no marriage can be contracted. In your view, do laws allowing individuals of the same gender to marry suggest or jeopardize those other restrictions in any way? I don't think so, no. Let me ask you one or, or two, I think, final questions. As a historical matter, is there any basis for concluding that allowing individuals of the same gender to marry would affect population growth? I don't see any reason for concluding that, no. Has there been a separation of church and state as to marriage in this country since its founding? Uh, yes. As a historical matter, does the fact that civil marriage borrowed and looked to some traditions from religion in formulating the law, does that make the institution of marriage in this country a religious institution? Definitely not. Uh, we are a multi-religious society, and our civil marriage serves to keep that harmonious society. Uh, different religions may place their requirements on marriages, but they are not superior to the civil law validation and authority over marriage. Are you, based on your study of history, a believer in the public institution of marriage? I believe it's a very valuable institution, yes. And do you think its value will be enhanced if individuals of the same gender are allowed to marry in this country? I think that judging from the way their advocacy over the past 20 years has raised the status of the institution in many people's eyes, made them appreciate its benefits, I would expect that, yes, amplifying it to allow them entry would be very beneficial to the institution. Your Honor, I'm going to consult with my colleagues. Thank you. All right. You, Your Honor, I believe that's the end of my questioning. I just wanted to make sure as a formal matter that the exhibits on the list that I had presented to the court were admitted into evidence before Professor Cott steps down. That's my understanding along with those referred by Mr. Thompson. Those were the judicial notice? That's correct. Let me ask, while you're on the stand, Professor, you described marriage as an instrument of government. How is it that the state or government became the principal formulator of this governance rather than the governance being left up to contractual relations between the parties or private institutions? Well, I think that simply, uh, let me put it this way, uh, our marriage rules are inherited from the colonists who originally were in this nation. And in both, uh, in both New England and the common law, in the civil law, uh, there were long traditions of governmental authority over marriage. Under the civil order, they were not exclusive to the government. Uh, that is, for three centuries in Europe, there are great tussles between the church and the state, uh, over which um, uh, the state over which uh, these authorities should control marriage. I'm sorry. Uh, for three or four centuries in Europe. And there are great tussles between the church and the state uh, over which these authorities should control marriage because of the extent to which it was a governing vehicle. But in all of the modern monarchies in Europe, the state won, and certainly in the most relevant to our institutions in the United States, 
in Britain, uh, the state retained control using the church as the ceremonial partner in marriage. Uh, the United States form going up from the colonies was even more decidedly toward the secular authority. I think it had a great deal to do with the fact that religious authority was very poorly established. Uh, ecclesiastical authority of the Church of England was extremely poorly established in the early United States, and there simply wasn't the bio biomass around to enter. Is what you're saying the state regulation of marriage was not invented in the United States? Oh, certainly not, certainly not. It came here as part of the heritage, heritage of those who settled in the United States. Yes. And what were the driving forces behind this growth of state regulation of marriage? Well, I wouldn't say growth. I would simply say that the, the states were the ones who set the terms. Uh, from the beginning, uh, from the beginning, uh, from colonial legislatures to state legislatures. I think what's, um, okay, perhaps this will clarify. But I understood you to say the state's role in the United States was more expansive, more vigorous than it had been in Europe. Is that a fair? No, uh, it's simply that there was no contest between the state and church of anything like the proportion that the contest between uh, monarchs and the Catholic church uh, that occurred over centuries in Europe. Uh, but not, it's simply that there wasn't so much of a contest. It was civil authority, not 100%, but you know, major, majority percent from the beginning. Uh, Maryland, for instance, was a more Catholic colony. It had more ecclesiastical authority over marriage, uh, certainly from the founding of the United States and establishment of state governments as compared to colonial legislatures under the British Empire. Uh, in all the state governments, secular authority over marriage was established, and it was considered part of the police power, uh, the power of the states over the health, safety, and welfare of their population. Uh, marriage rules were seen as part of that police power, and it's one of the reasons that, they, uh, that this power to regulate and define has remained at the state level and does by the Tenth Amendment. Um, well, is actually not part of federal power to prescribe, although federal policies on marriage have greatly uh, affected marriage. The states have the right to define marital entry, exit, etc. Was there some sort of a vacuum that state flower power was flowing into and filling? A vacuum because there was an absence of uh, private regulation or regulation by private entities or institutions? Well, in the Anglo-American tradition, marriage has always been a matter for governance. It was... Um, state governance. Mm -hmm. There is private governance and state governance. That's the distinction I'm trying to draw. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, uh, I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, when I use governance, I'm using it with respect to governmental authorities, and private contract is an essential to marriage. Uh, the contract of two parties to consent to marry one another. Uh, but that contract to marry is not valid in our nation unless the state joins it as a third party and says, I credit your private contract. Uh, that's what I meant in the very beginning by saying marriage is this unique public private blend in that it requires private free consent, but it involves the public in monitoring and settling the terms of whether that consent creates merely an informal relationship or a valid marriage. But what are those interests that the government has in this contract between two marriage partners? Uh, well, I think the interests are, uh, as I was suggesting, in bundling certain social rewards uh, with the duties that are imposed on the couple by the state uh, in order to incentivize stable long-term household formation and care of the couple for one another. Uh, the reciprocal bargain in marriage long ago when it was unequal and today is one spouse takes up the obligation to support the other in marriage and that is enforced by the state. Are you saying that in the absence of the uh, are you saying that in the absence of that bargain there are certain harms or externalities or social costs that flow and it's in the state's interest to regulate? Yes, uh, the state has always seen as, as it's in its interest to regulate, yes. And I think that interest continues. Very well. Thank you, Professor Kahn, for your testimony. You may step down. Why don't we take our luncheon break?
and be back and ready to go. If you can, 1.30.